good morning, Columbia Drive. Welcome to the virtual campus of the Columbia Drive United Methodist Church. We are delighted that you are here with us. It is always worth the virtual drive. Let's work. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Victory is mine, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today, victory today is mine. I told Satan, I told Satan, get thee behind, get thee behind, victory. Joy is mine, joy is joy mine. is mine, joy is joy mine. is mine, joy today is mine. I told Satan, I told Satan, get thee behind, get thee behind. Joy today, joy today is mine. What a mighty God we serve! What a mighty God! What a mighty God we serve! Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us continue our worship this morning through music.
God, I hope an age is past. I hope for years to come. I shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Lord, we've come this moment at this time to say thank you. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for keeping us. Lord, in times like these, it is refreshing to know that you are still in charge. And so, Lord, this morning, rather than give way to despair, rather than look at numbers that tend to depress, whether rather than look at news that tends to dissuade, we choose this morning to trust you. So simply this morning, Lord, take care of our families. Take care of our friends. Help us to understand that you are still in charge. We give you praise for life, health, and strength. We pray for our governmental authorities. We pray for countries around the world, and we ask that you would allow us to see your glory like never before. We ask all of these things in the rich and mighty name of Jesus, and the people of God said amen, amen, and amen. Well, friends, it's time now to honor the Lord with our giving. What a joy it is to be able to give to the Lord a portion of that with which the Lord has blessed us. Listen, we encourage you to give generously because this is a ministry that is still reaching out to those who need a hand up. This is a ministry that is still reaching out to those who need a helping hand, uh, who are hopeless and in need of the help that God's church can provide. When you give generously to this ministry, you are becoming the hands and feet of Christ. Instructions are on the screen. Won't you give now as God has blessed you? God loves a cheerful gift.
scripture lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter number 24 and we're reading verses 13 through 35. That's the gospel according to Luke chapter number 24 verses 13 through 35. This morning I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Listen now and hear the word of God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk alone? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near to the village which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road while he opened the scriptures to us that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together they were saying the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Yes, Lord. But when I really stop, I stop and think about it. gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ from the book of Luke, chapter number 24, verses 13 through 35. And so this morning, I wanted us to just talk. And I want to use as talking points this title on this morning, When Hope is Hidden, When Hope is is hidden. There's an awful lot to be, to be hopeless about in our world today. You can't turn on the TV or listen to the radio in real time and not feel that hopelessness is covering you like a wet blanket. It, it seems as if hope has disappeared from not only our community, but our nation and our world. Despite assurances that everything is going to be all right, many of us have our doubts because the facts just don't seem to align with the familial voices that tell us that everything is looking up. Got a question for you today. How are you dealing with hidden hope? Have you given way to hopelessness? Have you thrown up your hands and said things will never be what they used to be? Have you decided that you're going to just live the rest of your days in isolation and live the rest of your days in fear? Are you going to live the rest of your life in a hopeless posture? You know, life has a way of bringing about a change, doesn't it? If, if you look back to three months ago, there were many of us who did not have a care in the world. Life was good. The job was okay. And we had a routine that caused us to be comfortable and set. And we thought that life would always be like it always was. And yet fast forward, Three months and now life is drastically different than it has ever been in our entire lives. I've had the opportunity to poll persons much older than myself and they have said to me almost to a person, I have never seen it like this before. That's the, 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 the chorus that most people will utter whenever you talk about the situation that we're in. I have never seen it like this before. Indeed, that's true. But I want to 
submit to you that even though we have never seen circumstances like we are living today, there still exists the greatest moments of our lives in front of us if we can just trust in God and believe in his keeping power. This text that we have read from today is a perfect example of what it looks like when hope is hidden. Jesus has been crucified. Three days have elapsed and the text takes us on a road to Emmaus. Two disciples are walking. One of them, his, his name is Cleophas, is talking with his companion when out of nowhere, a man falls in with them and hearing their discussion, he asks them, what are y'all talking about? They stop and they look still at him and they say to him, you must be new in town. You got to be new because you've not yet heard of all that has transpired in Jerusalem. He said, what, what are you talking about? And they said, there was a man named Jesus. He was mighty in word and deed. And here are the words that I don't want you to miss in the text. They said, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. We, we had hoped that Jesus was the one who would make everything all right. We had hoped that he was the one that would calm our fears and relieve our doubts. We had hoped that he was the one who would overthrow Roman oppression. We had hoped that things would be like they used to be. Jesus, in classic Jesus style, <coughs> does what nobody else can do like him. He begins to tell them how foolish they were <laughs> to expect that things would be like they always were. This brings me to the first thing that I want you to remember. This is my first point. Hope is always a desire. The text tells us that the disciples had hoped that Jesus was the one, but somehow that hope had been crushed because they allowed what their eyes saw to determine what their minds should have rejected. <laughs> Don't you miss that. They determined that just because it looks bad, it must be bad. And I want to tell you today, there are some things that people of faith will always do. People of faith will always understand that they can't believe their eyes. They've got to believe what God says. Hope is a desire. Do you believe that God is able to keep you? Do you believe that everything that God has promised is available to those who trust him? Do you believe that God has plans for your life? Hope is a desire. When Jesus hears them talk about the fact that it has been three days since Jesus has died and three days since he has been in the tomb and when he hears them describe that certain women of their company had seen an empty tomb, he stops for a moment and says, you are crazy and foolish not to believe that God would not do exactly what God has promised to do. He says it this like this, oh how foolish you are and oh how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Listen, 
The second thing that I want to tell you, here's my second point, is that hope is a destination. You don't get there after despair very quickly. There is a process by which you step towards the hope that God has promised. Corey Ten Boom says that joy runs deeper than despair. I like that because it teaches us that hope is definitely a destination. You may be down today, but joy is going to come in the morning. Weeping may be occurring at this moment, but in the morning, there's going to be some joy. You've got to hold on to the night because hope is a destination. Jesus, in classic Jesus style, Begins with Moses, and he interpreted to them himself. I like that about Jesus. Nobody but Jesus can show you who Jesus is. Today, there's someone who's looking at me, and, and you've been kind of skeptical. You've been wondering, what is it that I've got to do to find some peace? What is it that I've got to do to find some joy? What is it that I've got to do to get some sleep at night? I see you. You're up at night. You're tossing and you're turning. You're worrying about your family. You're worrying about tomorrow. When you allow Jesus to show you Jesus, the hope that is a destination grows closer and closer with every step that you take. Jesus explains to them himself, starting at Moses, and as they get near their destination, Jesus walks on ahead as if he were going to go on past them. And they beg him, no, stay with us. It's, it's almost nighttime. There's no need for you to keep going. Jesus will leave if you don't ask him to stay. And Jesus turns in with them. And when he turns in with them, something happens. Jesus sits down with them. He takes bread, he blesses it, and he breaks it. And when he does that, all of a sudden, the hope that was hidden became apparent. They looked at Jesus as he broke that bread and they said to themselves, I've seen this before. They look at Jesus as he lifts and breaks bread and says, I, I saw this before. I, I saw it when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives and there were 5,000 men, women, and children, and even more there. And they said, I have seen this before. Brings me to my third point. <coughs> Hope, my friend is the stimulus check of heaven. There, there's no better way to understand what hope is than to understand the phenomenon that has occurred during this pandemic called COVID. Uh, as you know, the government has issued millions of stimulus checks. Those checks were designed to stimulate the economy back into some modicum of stability. But you know, a stimulus is only as strong as the stimulator. I, I want you to catch that. I don't want you to miss that. The stimulus is only as strong as the stimulator. There are folk who will take their stimulus, but the stimulator will be wrong and nothing will happen because the stimulator and the stimulus don't equate. But Jesus is the divine stimulator and hope is the stimulus check of heaven. When they saw Jesus lift that bread, their hope 
was restored. What do you see Jesus lifting even in the midst of this pandemic? I bet you hadn't thought about the fact that you have the perfect opportunity to spend more time with your family and to lift them with your love. I bet you hadn't thought about the fact that now more than ever, you've got more time to tend to your health than you ever have before. I wonder if you have figured out that now is the time to call those long distance family members and those long forgotten friends and lift them with a word from afar. Hope is the stimulus check of heaven. And when Jesus broke that bread, something came together for the disciples. You see, hope is usually lost when something is broken. But when Jesus lifted the bread and broke it, he teaches us that there is hope in broken things. This morning, I want you to consider the broken things in your life and understand that there is hope in brokenness. When hope is hidden, it's an opportunity for us to see Jesus. Won't you see him today as you have never seen him before? In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, today we've learned that what our eyes see and what our hearts believe can sometimes be drastically different. When hope is hidden, Jesus shows up and he breaks and blends so that we understand that hope is all around us. That hope exists in broken things. Friends, at this moment, we invite you to take the broken pieces of your life and allow Jesus to show you that hope is still a very real possibility for you. If you don't have a church home, you don't belong to a body of believers, we invite you to join this virtual family. Listen, you don't need an aisle to walk down. All you need is the confession that you want to trust Jesus with your life and that you want to unite with this body of believers called Columbia Drive. God has touched you this morning and this is your moment. And you know it? Leave us a comment down in Facebook, leave us a comment on our website, www.cdumc, and we'll be praying with you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, friends, receive this parting blessing. Now unto him who is the hope of the hopeless. Now unto him who brings joy to the joyless. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Let us say together.